Welcome to Fun Pilot Podcast, where we are unpacking opinions and changing destinations. I am your host, Shirley Altador, where each week we will chat about how to rise strong out of all types of obstacles that come with relationships. Through personal life experiences and discussions ranging from infidelity, trust, forgiveness, sex, heartbreak, self-love, and so much more. I am passionate and obsessed to provide guidance to every woman to create a better life. Let's dive in, pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. With me, your virtual girlfriend. Welcome back to Fun Palais Podcast. Today we have another episode of Story Time. Our special guest today is Helen Edwards. Helen is truly an authentic being, a wild woman, an example of a raw voice, a mother of an incredible young airman. She is a universe, nature, and brain and body forever student currently a nomad who lives between Arizona and Wyoming. She is also the entrepreneur of Sexy Freedom Media and host to the Sexy Freedom Media podcast. It is her true desire to provide affordable and life-shifting workshops, events, retreats for both men and women to free themselves of other people's opinions. Hey, Helen, how are you? Great. I got to tell you, your voice is so nice. It's like very soothing. Thank you. You know what? I hear that a lot. (laughs) And you know what I've also heard? Girl, you go from like everyday person to like sex therapist or like a sex operator. I'm like, really? (laughs) Okay. Well, I guess that's a good thing. (laughs) Thank you. A very good compliment. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for being on the show. I appreciate that, Helen. Um, You're going to provide us with some insight today of your past. Yes, I am. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess we can start off with telling us a little bit about your relationship in the past or presently. I mean, you can start your story off however you would like. Sure. So, okay. So one of the subjects we're going to talk about today is something I rarely talk about that a lot of people don't know that I talk about unless they've read my book. So my book is called Nothing Sexier Than Freedom. Uh, it took me about five years to write because it was a journey. And I began writing the book. First of all, I didn't know I was going to be an author. Okay. Um, I just didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I was in that period in my life where I was like, I don't know what to do with my life. I just like to write, but I didn't like to write. Like, I don't like to be committed to anything. So let's start there with commitment. Commitment was a big problem for me. But I watched the movie, The Notebook, and it really inspired me because, uh, you know, the woman lost her, her memory and her husband comes back and reads her story to her. And at the time I was having a lot of fun dating men and, you know, going out with my girls. So I thought, wow, early dementia runs into my family. So what if I write stories that if something were to happen with my memory, or if I were to pass away early, you know, that my friends and family can read to themselves or read to me if I get, you know, lose my mind one day. So I began there. So I started writing funny stories about my dating life. My dating life at the time consisted of, you know, I was, I was a notorious cheater. Um, and I didn't realize it was a habit of mine or a belief of some sort that was embedded into me until I got my editor, my first editor after a hundred pages who started questioning me on why I thought certain reasoning behind why I was cheating, you know, so I'd, I'd tell a story about me cheating. And then she'd ask, well, why did you think that? Why did you think that was okay? Why did you have no feelings about it? Why did you feel no remorse? And then I started wondering the same thing. Huh, that is weird. Okay. 
So that's why don't I feel bad? So, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to reel back. Okay. One good thing is a lot of times I'm not a big TV person, but I have seen the notebook and it is a very touching movie that everyone mm -hmm. should watch. It's very, because she loses her memory completely and he's reading her the stories. It's actually very emotional and heartwarming and it's cute. You know, it's one of those, like, I, I like it, but Helen, um, how far back does this go, if you don't mind me asking? And at what point did it start? Or is this immediately something? Did you realize when you started doing it? Yes, I through writing, it uh -huh. became my therapy. Okay, through different editors points of views. I actually went through five editors, oh. five years, five editors. Wow. So I had different perspectives on the book. And I soon realized that I had to go back. I'm telling you childhood trauma, oh. <laughs> what they say when they say go back into your childhood and find out where your beliefs and everything comes from. And mine did begin, you know, actually in the womb. Oh. Um, you know, so I found out when I was 17 that I was uh, the only one that had a different, I'll say blood father, because okay. my dad has always been my dad. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that, that he wasn't until... I was 17. Okay. And then began my journey of, you know, oh, and then I, I knew about it. Mm -hmm. I knew I, you know, was only one that had a different dad, but I was the second oldest. So there was three after. So I started to put it all together. Like, oh, my mom had an affair. And you're a product. And I don't mean to say I'm it a, that I'm way. A, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> I apologize. I don't mean to offend, but you are a product of an affair. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I actually wrote, I wrote that those words are not offensive at all. I actually okay. wrote that. I, I used to joke around about it actually in my twenties when I was constantly cheating and I would say, you know, I'm a, I'm an affair baby. It runs in my blood, you know, and that was the way I kind of felt proud about it. Okay. At that time, everybody at that time. <laughs> no, I, I totally understand because you know, Helen, you're not the only one. And I have some, uh, words mm -hmm. of it, uh, I would like to actually ask you some advice since you are a product of that. Okay, so now we're fast forwarding. You realize this at 17 that your older siblings and your younger siblings have a different father, even though the man has been in your life. I'm assuming your parents figured out how to work it out because they stayed together, I am assuming. And we don't need to get into your parents. I guess it's just as simple. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. sure. So that's that's another blessing of itself that your father was able to look past that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now <laughs> at 17, who told you? Uh, actually, a boyfriend of one of my sisters who overheard it from my mom and her friend. So, and you know, the thing was, it was really strange because I really didn't care. I, I was just like, oh, okay. And then my mom took me on this long road trip and she explained everything to me. And it was really heavy. It was really heavy to hear what she went through mm -hmm. and the abuse that she went through and the choices she made and the, you know, things she tried to do to get away from my father at the time. And just, it was so heavy at 17, 17 to hear, but I took it in because I knew my mom needed an ear. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't care. I, I wasn't one of those kids who were like, I'm going to go find my dad and I want to find out this and find out that I was just like, ah, all right. Okay. The life goes on. Okay. And it did for many, many years. Got it. So now we see you had to peel back all the way back to that layer to see now you were yes. a product of something you didn't even realize like, okay, this is the underlying reason of why I'm the way I am. Okay. So now you're older, you're having relationships. Was it your first mm -hmm. relationship, your second, your third? When did you start doing this prolific cheating? Oh gosh. My earliest memory is like the first time I was in a relationship. Oh. So it began the very first time. And, and I, it, it was like a hunger in me, to be honest. Okay. It was like this hunger. I remember feeling, and it, the reason I recognize this is because when I looked back at the pattern, mm -hmm. I could see the same desire coming up. It was a desire, is this hunger that the world was off balance if I did not have, you know, multiple relationships. 
I see. Okay, that's 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 a different thinking. The world was off balance. If so, were you deciding to be in these men wanted monogamous relationships, but in your mind, where you were just saying, "Yeah, mm-hmm. okay, whatever," I'll tell you, yes, but I'm going to do what I want to mm-hmm. do. Was that pretty much the underlying thing that was going through your head? No, (laughs) you never started off like that. (laughs) So (laughs) how did you step astray? Like normally, uh, okay, so I am, I have cheated on my partner. My partner have cheated on me. So I have an underlying understanding. You don't just fall into, you know, you don't just jump on someone's penis or, you know, it's not just like how people sometimes think of it. You don't just fall into it. It takes buildup. So I totally understand Mm -hmm. that it takes time to build up. You don't just see somebody and it's like, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to be a little hoe. And no, it doesn't happen like that. It really, truly doesn't. Yeah. But why did you do this? And you did it to more than one man. You did it to several men in the relationship. How did you disconnect that? Did you not care about them at all? Well, no, it, it had nothing to do with caring. In oh. fact, I, I, the way I viewed it was a different way. So there was some cases where I, I would say the majority of it came from like what you're talking about, building up, it mm-hmm. built up, it started as a great relationship, honeymoon situation. But as soon as I found even one thing to, um, kind of give me permission to go do it. I did it. Yes. So if the, like, let's just say I found porn on his phone. Let's just say I found him talking to another girl. Let's just say I even saw him looking at another woman, you know, it's something would click and it was like, you're free to go do what you need to do. Interesting. I like the way you phrase that um, because obviously you may not be the only person who thinks like that. And that's interesting. You, there was mm-hmm. no discussing it. We didn't need to communicate. Once you s- showed me this deceit it gave me the permission to go do what i wanted to do very interesting okay so at what point now words when we say when you say prolific serial cheater what's the most what out of all your relationships what's the most you've ever cheated on the one individual are we talking about five times with (laughs) five people no well so When I wrote the book, I started realizing the pattern I had. Uh, I always had to have somebody else. So it was like I'd have somebody on standby. And that person didn't know it. So I had rules. Um, Never be with a married man. Okay. Uh, Never be with a man who has a woman. Okay. Or, you know, or a partner on the side. Okay. Um, Never be a side chick. (laughs) Gotcha. Um, So everything I... It's a strange thing, but I always wanted to stay in some type of integrity with my rules. And if my rules broke, that meant that I was actually. So when you're okay, let me take it this way. When you're a notorious cheater, you attract a lot of other cheaters and not necessarily cheating is a bad term. I'm talking about other women who open up to you about cheating, other men who open up to you about cheating. And they're looking for somebody to kind of get this weight off them because I met a lot of cheaters who felt horrible and and they were, it was killing them inside. Mm -hmm. Whereas me, it was like no big deal. So we had multiple conversations and I met a variety of different types of styles of cheating. Some who purposely were out to hurt people, some who were purposely out to be with people, you know, women who were with men who are married and, or women who are with men who had girlfriends, um, you know, they just couldn't help themselves. There was this drive. So there was, there was interesting different uh, types of styles of cheaters that I learned of. And I remember thinking, I can't be, I had boundaries, like you said earlier, there were boundaries even with cheating for me. And I, the reason why I had boundaries is because I knew how hurtful it felt when somebody cheated on me and you know again if somebody cheated on me that was it that was probably the the worst thing because then again it gave me permission to even strike back like 
tenfold. Mm -hmm. And I understand what you mean by boundaries, because even though I cheated on my significant other, I thought the same way you thought. I did not want to engage with a man who was in a relationship. I didn't want to be anybody's side chick. And I know it sounds crazy for someone who has not been on our side of town, Helen, to be like, Mm -hmm. yeah, you're fucking cheating, but you're setting boundaries. That sounds ludicrous. But unless you are actually in our shoes, you really truly can't understand what we're talking about. But I understand what you mean about setting the boundaries, about not being a side chick, not messing with a married man. He had he had to be single and, you know, he you had to know, like, you belong to me. That way I had two people that I was fooling around with on the side. But regardless what situation you're in, then there are boundaries. And I like the fact that you say the different styles because there are women that their boundaries are different. I had a great mm-hmm. interview with someone who she wasn't married or in a relationship at the time, but she didn't have a problem. Um, having sex, I guess we'll say, with a married man. The, what she mm-hmm. did was she told me is I detached my emotions from it. I did not know mm-hmm. his wife. I did not need to know his wife. I didn't care to know what, who his wife was. And I didn't right. go into the situation expecting anything from him other than sex. And she even yeah. shed some light to me because she was, and I said, well, how do some women don't know how to How do someone have all these expectations when they decide to cheat with a married man or become a side chick and they have all these expectations? And I had told her, I said, I knew I did not want to mess with a married man or a man who was in a relationship because it was too much emotions involved for me. So I cut Mm -hmm. that off at the door. And she says, that's the difference between you and someone else. You knew You didn't want your emotions to get caught up. So you immediately eliminated those men right from the door. That's why you wanted a single man. Yes. A woman becomes a side chick because they are not aware of these emotions or they don't want to fess up to them or own up to them and realize that, listen, girl, maybe you shouldn't mess with a married man because your expectations are going to be ludicrous because majority of the time they don't leave the other woman to be with you you're literally mm-hmm. just so, a sexual entertainment that's all you really are <laughs> and yeah. it's interesting yeah. that she told me that because as women you know a lot of times our emotions get extremely involved and we lie to ourselves and yes. acting like we can really mm-hmm. truly handle these emotions when really we can't mm-hmm. and i guess that's what creates side chick situations that's where these women who end up being side chicks have all these expectations thinking like, I thought you was going to leave them. Never believe what he says, (laughs) you know, (laughs) never believe what the person is telling you because if he's sleeping at home with somebody else at night, girl, do you really think, but we lie to ourselves. This is what we do. So I'm, I'm very happy that she said that and you attract cheaters. That is that. Do you realize that's an energy too? You attract the people. I guess it's yes. kind of like you attract positive energy and you attract negative energy. Yes. You were attracting yep. all these cheaters around you. And did it yes. like when did you realize you need to wake up? Because you are in a relationship now, which things yes. are <laughs> extremely different. So extremely. when did you realize you needed to wake up? When did you said, Helen, I got to stop this shit? Okay, so I'll tell you a couple things actually. Um, <laughs> karma's a bitch. Oh <laughs> shit! I'll say that right now. <laughs> Look, it's very true. What you put out, you will get back. Like you're mentioning about the energy, you know, mm-hmm. like attracts like, and you know, I just kept attracting the same type of men and the same um, type of conversations and. While I was writing, I'm big in self-improvement, self-development. Actually, I've been in it since I was a kid. But the more I got older, the more I realized, okay, I'm evolving. My beliefs are evolving. My habits are evolving. And even though this is so far embedded in my life, in my my veins, in my beliefs, in my my feelings, my emotions, like everything, you know, even the even the ability not to feel. Mm-hmm. I have to evolve in this also. And it's a big challenge, but 
you kind of get your challenges broken when you get broken down. And I mean, I, there were two relationships specifically that broke me down. Mm -hmm. One was falling in love very hard with somebody who never touched me. I mean, he just stopped touching me and I was with him for seven years. And it surprisingly, he was the one that I cheated on the least. <laughs> so it was, it was interesting to me because I lost so much confidence from not being physically touched and, and kind of pretty much begging to be, you know, for the attention and the touching mm -hmm. that I realized something I realized it, it was like a moment of clarity. Okay. Karma starting to come back around to me. And then a second relationship where I, I fell again, once again, heavenly involved and in, in, in love. And, uh, the man turned out to be a narcissist and I never been with a narcissist before. So that was an interesting situation. And you got to remember during this time, I'm evolving and who I am and becoming a better person and strengthening myself and helping other people. So I realized what is a relationship look like with just me, me and my relationship with myself. Am I going to cheat on myself? Like, let's find out. So I did, I stopped having relationships with men and I started having a relationship with myself. And actually I realized I did cheat on myself, hmm. I started cheating on myself. I started, uh, going behind my back and doing things I said I wouldn't do. And that's when I realized it's not just men. It's not just relationships. It's, it's a pattern and I've got to break it if I want to succeed in the things I want to succeed in, because they're, they're not going to take that. It's not, it's not acceptable anymore. Exactly. So exactly. is the hunger and the, the desire still there to cheat? Honestly? Yes, it is. It's, daily practice, it's daily discipline, it's taking, you know, shifting the mind and the energy in other areas, it's communicating with my partner now. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely know the universe delivered my partner because we are completely opposite. I never in my mind ever thought I'd end up in Wyoming. And, you know, we, we began as friends, and we never thought we'd be together. So we told each other everything. I mean, no skeletons in the closet. Oh, he, he knows. knows everything about me. I know everything about him. And this is something if I were dating and I were just meeting somebody, I would never tell them these things. But because I thought I'd never see this person again, they were they were my guide in traveling. I thought, meh, that could be not? frightening, I'll girl. Just... Yeah, well, nothing gets thrown in my face. We That's have good. a very similar past. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think the thing is, is that all my needs are being met. Good. And we have a very open and honest relationship. And the desire that I have, like I said, it's still there, but it's very small. It's like a very small, tiny uh, piece of coal. And I'm not going to fan the flame. So now would is having an open relationship something that would be interesting to you? Or has oh, I mean, ever... open is in we talk. <laughs> you, no, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Are you talking about multiple relationships? Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, no. She said, no, <laughs> it's a no for me. Okay. <laughs> it's right. a no for me. Actually. Yeah. There's a lot of people who suggested it saying, you know, maybe you should talk yeah. with your partner and have an open relationship. I actually tried it. Um, it's not for me. Okay. And, uh, I, I wrote about it and I'm a monogamous person. That's what I'd like to be. Um, it's just habits. I gotta, yeah, it's I just a behavior you need to change. But obviously, Helen, yes. there's been extreme amount of growth because look how quick you were like, no, we're not doing any open relationship. Yeah, no. <laughs> that is not happening. <laughs> no. You know, I totally get it. Now, how long did the person you fall in love with? You said you were together for seven years and they just cold, tur cold turkey stopped touching you. How long did that last? Actually, that started in the very beginning. Oh. So, you know, those lies that you were talking about that we tell ourselves, yes. you know, when you fall in love with somebody, all of a sudden you start making excuses for somebody else's behavior. You think they're going to change. I mean, it's the same stories over and over and same habits. And that's what I did for him. In fact, um, I even told him uh, I broke up with him after four months and mm -hmm. I told him and he was he was devastated. OK. And uh, I he asked me why. And I said, because if I don't break up with you, I will cheat on you. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to hurt him because I was very much in respect to him. And he, he begged me back and, you know, and, and I remember, I'll never forget. I remember thinking, 
if I get back in this relationship and he doesn't touch me and he continues his same behaviors, the ones he's saying he's never going to do again, that he's going to change. I know I'm going to cheat on this man, but I chose love. Mm -hmm. I chose the idea, the fantasy over knowing exactly what I was going to do, you know, and I did, I, I cheated on him multiple times. Even though you knew like I, I shouldn't get back with him. And the minute he started exactly. doing what he was doing, instead of walking away, you just yeah. reverted right back to your negative behavior. Right. Well, one of the things I mentioned is um, when you know yourself and you know your habits, mm -hmm. you know, one of my habits too was at that time, I would, when I'd get in relationships, I'd stay in them no matter how bad they were. And I knew this was a habit because I try, I mean, I'd cry and you know, even when I was getting abused physically and, and mentally, I would, I would still make up excuses for this person that they were going to change. And I, you know, I had like an out of body experience, like you are, you, you are the same, you're habitual, mm -hmm. you're going to take it and take it and take it and take it. So I also started using or noticing my cheating pattern was a way for me to slowly get out of something. I see. Slowly get away. Okay. So I didn't, that's why I didn't perceive it as all negative. It's almost like it became a weapon of disguise for me to slowly get out. Cause if I had somebody else on the side, loving me and touching me, then I knew that there was somebody out there who would do that again. And I can get out of this awful relationship eventually. Gotcha. Now, what is your thought process on women who do sleep with married men or men who are in a relationship? since you've been on the other side of the spectrum, we both have been. And I want to hear your thought mm -hmm. on for women who do take the time to mess with a married man or a man who's in a relationship and do not know truly how to separate the emotions or choose not to, or think in their mind that he's going to leave, something's going to happen. You know, we're going sure. to be together. What is your thought and take on that? And why as women, especially do we feel, I feel, I shouldn't say I'm not battering women and feel like we're the only one there are men out there mm -hmm. who are side dudes you just don't hear about them as much but yeah. why <laughs> do women put themselves in that situation as though this man is the only piece of penis on the face of this earth that we can tap into but instead we allow ourselves to be so hurt and put down and be treated as the next best option yeah, see, that's so that's a tough situation there, because here's the thing. Um, I've met a lot of women. And surprisingly, a lot of men who have had relationships with married people. Mm -hmm. And when I was a notorious cheater, I couldn't just go judging them. You know, I can. One of the things I did do is I'd say, well, you know, you know that they're not going to leave them. And if they do. They could possibly do the same thing to you. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to live with that fear, you know, unless you do some really crazy work, which is, it's, you know, possible. Yes. Um, if there's women out there right now that are with married men, um, I think one of the things you need to, my, my humble suggestion is um, men aren't the only thing you want. Okay. You want financial freedom. You want a great life. You have to remember that when you're choosing a married man or a married woman, you're kind of thinking from a place of scarcity and lack. Okay. So you're going to attract those things in other parts of your life. And it's not just with this person. And there's also a fantasy. You need to ask yourself, are you involved in a relationship with a fantasy or with the actual person? Mm -hmm. Because those are two different things. And some, most of the time you're involved with the fantasy. Because if that person is treating you like an option, a side thing, then, I mean, you're devaluing yourself. And that's a hard pill to swallow because a lot of cheaters already know that. We already know we're devaluing ourselves and we've accepted that. Mm -hmm. And that acceptance is something that you need to face and, and become courageous with. And, and it's another, I'm going to use this phrase, but it's used for something that I, I talk about 
protecting the throne. So it's kind of like, it's like a demon, right? It's like a self-sabotaging, devaluing demon that comes to your door and you need to get courageous and bold and basically say enough, no more. Mm -hmm. This is going to hurt, but this is the pain is what's going to help me grow. And that's how I did it. It hurt, it hurt me to cut off relationships, side relationships. It hurt me to cut off ties and have a relationship just with myself because I was very codependent and, but that hurt allowed me to grow. Exactly. And trust me, you guys, it is way better on the other side. It is way better on the other side. I feel like when you choose to stop making, I call it it a cowardice move when you cheat, you, you know, and I say it confidently because I'm not pointing fingers because I, I was a cheater. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have been on the other side and it was a cowardice move that I made, uh, yeah. because I didn't want to communicate with my partner and it was easier for me to ask him for forgiveness than to go and ask him for permission. I'm not asking you for permission yeah. and same like you. You weren't giving me what I was desiring at the time. So I made a choice to do what I wanted to do, which was wrong. So mm -hmm. word of advice I have for you, since you are, a, uh, you know, an affair baby, I don't even know. What do you call it? Like, what do you call that? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you know, okay. An affair baby, a product of the same situation. Now, when my partner cheated, a child was created. So I was a stepmom, not by choice. And, you know, mm -hmm. I look at it as a situation as an eye opening because I took a negative in my life and turn it mm -hmm. into a positive. And when I say a positive, I can freely comfortably now talk about that part of my life without my voice crackling mm -hmm. or breaking down. And I use it as a testimony into my life. But what yeah. word of advice do you have to offer me as this little girl's grown up in my life, knowing mm -hmm. she's, but she's six now. So as she gets mm -hmm. older, the pieces of the puzzle are going to connect. I mean, you were 17 when you found out. Right. I'm assuming your family kind of kept it quiet. It, it, we're not going to talk about your family, mm -hmm. but your parents didn't let you know when you were young. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, she doesn't know the underlying issue of why my dad lives somewhere else. My mom lives somewhere else. I have a brother and sister. And, mm -hmm. you know, she's probably in her little mind trying to piece everything together. But what yeah. word of advice would you have to offer me as she's growing up to, yeah, I guess, just word of advice for me and even for anybody else who might be in this situation? You'd, you'd never know how to act, even with my own children. They are fully aware of what's going on. Now, my daughter's soon to be 14. So two years ago, mm -hmm. she said, out of the blue, she said, so daddy cheated on you. And that's when I realized she knew what happened. Mm -hmm. I never told her, but I knew mm -hmm. she knew what took place. Right. So how do I be a pillar to all three of these children and not make sure. such a huge negative out of it? And especially not make her feel like, listen, even though this happened and it is what it is, you're mm -hmm. still a beautiful soul, a beautiful light. And there's so much you can do in this world. Don't let that cripple you regardless how you came mm -hmm. to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's very admirable that you have and, and taken the role as a pillar and what a queen you are. I think. Oh, thank you. Uh, it, it, it's come with many healing, Helen. It's not, I, you know, as, as we can sit and even you, as we both of us are sitting behind this mic, sharing our stories to other women mm -hmm. out there who are going through whatever it is they may be going through. We are, mm -hmm. both of us are a pillar, a light, a voice for them to know, oh my gosh, yes. I'm not alone. I'm not the yes. only one, you know, like there are others. Right. It's just everyone's journey is mm -hmm. different. Some people are not ready to come out and like, you don't know how many Definitely. messages and emails I've gotten. Oh my God, thank you. It's nice to know that yeah. I have a shoulder to lean on. And it's like, oh my gosh, I, you know, there are a whole bunch mm -hmm. of people out there, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, okay. Yes, definitely. Um, I think what would, what has helped for me, something that my mom did mm -hmm. that I kind of wish she had done more of was, um, maybe choose some words to instill in me 
Okay. Um, and I kind of got this from my boyfriend now. Okay. Um, what his dad did for him is he instilled the word integrity through his whole life. And he made, he basically kind of said, you know, every situation they had, every situation they talked about, um, problematic diversity, anything came back to the word integrity. Okay. And because of that, that is locked into him, that that is his highest value in life. And for me, it was a different word. <laughs> what word was that? It's the word wild. The word wild was instilled in me. Okay. My mom, uh, it, it was wild and strength. Okay. And the reason the word strength is because my mom, after she left my dad, she um, would always say, you know, women can do it better than men. We don't need a man's help. So that those words were constantly instilled in me growing up. Gotcha. And, you know, when you're something that I probably could have used more was was maybe commitment, keep your word, which is something now I do. Mm -hmm. um, words that I had instilled myself, keep your word, uh, commitment, you're committed. You said you were gonna do it, you stay committed, you finish until you're done. Mm -hmm. You know, focus, focus on this one thing because my lack of focus made me learn how to, and this is great because it's helped me today with all of my businesses and everything, but but had I learned to focus and commitment and, uh, you know, be a person of my word, maybe I would have not thought it so easily to just lie, you gotcha. know, things like that. And um, talking to your children, that's something that I do for my son. You know, um, I, I'm not really sure what my son knows. He's 21 now, but I know he knows that me and his father divorced when he was really young. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, I, I only talk really good about his dad to him. Um, but eventually we'll have to have a deeper conversation when he's ready. And, um, you know, that was uh, part of our party. Part of our divorce was, um, infidelity on my end, you know? Gotcha. So, so those are things I'm going to eventually have to talk about. And I'm very remorse. If there's anything, any type of remorse at all that I ever felt from cheating, mm -hmm. cause I'm gonna tell you, I don't feel bad about any of it except one. And that's the one with my marriage because I lost my family because of it. Gotcha. So I lost my son. Gotcha. So that, you know, like I said, karma comes back around and, and, um, your kids are products of you. Mm -hmm. They're products of your lineage. They're things that even unspoken words and stories, they're going to feel. Yes. They're going to feel in their body and it's going to come out in their life. And they're going to wonder like, I don't even know why I'm doing this, but I'm doing this, you know, and you want to talk to them about it before they figure it out themselves. <laughs> yeah. That's what I've tried. I've, I've spoken to them in little bits and pieces, mm -hmm. um, especially mm -hmm. the two that I'm around the most. I've spoken to them in small doses and I've allowed mm -hmm. them to connect the dots as need be. Once they get older, right before they start living on their own, which mm -hmm. is, oh my gosh, around the corner, but like an old head. But um, yeah, <laughs> but I will give them a little bit more because one of the reason I feel like this podcast is going to be an opportunity that they can listen to as well and tap mm -hmm. into and see what's my mom talking about, even though they walk in on me every now and then, Helen, but they mm -hmm. don't really truly understand what is being discussed. And right. I want them to, I never like to portray this uh, perfection to my children. I'm sure, not perfect. Sure. Your father is not perfect. We're doing the best that we can to raise you guys. There's no manual to this life. And you know, as a mother, mm -hmm. everyone's doing the best that they can. And I don't think my kids know that I cheated. And that's why mm -hmm. I never want them to make their father feel like, oh, he's just an awful individual. He cheated. Mom cheated right. too. Let's yeah. take a step back. Sure. We're not going to throw unnecessary yeah. stones here. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's how mm -hmm. I approach it in small doses. But, you know, thank you yeah. for the word of advice. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, opinions. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's all needed. It's a dose of encouragement for someone out there. Yeah. So that's and a I good think thing. if I just want to mention one more thing, Shirley, is um I read this book and it's called the female brain mm -hmm. and it was a game changer for me. I met it. I read it many years ago, actually um, during the writing of my book, because I wanted to know why I was the way 
I was. Mm -hmm. And if you read the book, and I highly recommend it, especially if you have young girls, because we want to know what the processes of their brain development, their hormone development, what's going on, right? Okay. At different stages in our life. And for me, it helped me realize many, actually many women are hardwired to have multiple relationships. Oh. And um, it's, it's pretty crazy. And it's, you know, when I realized that there was a, a part of me that felt a sense of freedom, like, okay, okay, okay. I'm hardwired. Maybe it wasn't just from what I came from. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm hardwired too. Maybe I got that gene. And if that's the case, then I get to choose now my path. Do I want to be monogamous or do I want to have what you said earlier, an open relationship? So now I felt like the power was back to me. I've made the choice to have a monogamous relationship. So definitely check that book out. Definitely. And I'll mine. put that. No, uh, <laughs> I wanted to end. Number one, I will get more information from you about the book called The Female Mind. Put it at the bottom of the web page when this does post. Tell everyone where they can find your book and truly okay. what your book is really about. I'm assuming it's about your story, your life, everything. Yes. So um, my book is Nothing Sexier Than Freedom. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble online. Okay. You can get a signed copy on Etsy, uh, my website, sexyfreedom.com, and everything else is on there. Um, okay. Yes, the book is actually, it began with the journey of, or the, uh, the cheating stories, let's say, but it actually has much more than that. It's got travel, um, the wildness of life, the zest for life, spiritualness. Um, I actually ended the book with a dedication to suicide prevention, suicide awareness. Um, okay. While the book was going through editing, uh, my brother took his life. So it was very devastating. And I realized that the book couldn't just end on some happy note. It had to end with some strong, powerful uh, gift back to any reader who reads it to to keep keep thriving. Gotcha. Don't give up. Okay, wonderful. So I will put all the information for your book at the bottom of the website. And, yeah. you know, definitely something I need to check out because I love self help books. And I love books that, yeah. you know, don't <laughs> give me anything about history. I ain't reading it. But most likely I can tell you that right now. <laughs> but yeah. um, when it comes to self help, I'm all about bettering myself and trying to be a better me. I like how you said I realized that I was cheating myself and I had to change that behavior. Listeners, we need to realize that cheating is a very negative behavior. You're speaking to two women who have been victims and perpetrators in this situation. And I'm going to tell you, it's a cowardice move to make. Regardless, if you choose to mess with a married man, regardless if you're a ch side chick, it all falls under the umbrella of cheating. And you really need to ask yourself, why are you cutting yourself short? Why are you devaluing yourself like that? Really? It, what is it? What is it that you're missing that you need to step out and have a night of passion for what joy does that really truly bring you? Does it bring you any joy? So you need to ask yourself, what am I cheat? Why am I cheating myself like that? That's the big question I want you to take away here today is why am I cheating myself? Helen, I want to thank you so much for being on the show and providing us with this insightful information. Your book is definitely going to be something I'm going to look into because, uh, girl, every day I need to do better. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, I appreciate you coming on the show. As always, listeners, I like to end with love yourself, voice yourself and be yourself. And until the next podcast, you guys have a great one. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Fun Pale Podcast. If you want to continue the conversation or share your takeaways, I want to hear from you. Head on over to the website or join our Facebook community and comment your favorite part of the show or share your thoughts. I want to hear what you have to say. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Chat with you next week.